Part two, evangelism for everyday life. Um, remember, if you miss a lesson, go to our webpage, click on learn, click on focus, and then click on so we may go evangelism for everyday life. And on there you will see the videos as we go there. This is a 10 part series. You will see the videos. And so if you only get part of it, you've got to watch the video. If you only watch 10 minutes of it, it's not enough. You've got to watch the entire video. So get online. It's real easy. I, have, I, I can't make it any simpler. Uh, also, if you're just tuning in or if you're watching this months later, uh, we're in the month of March right now, but you may be watching this a year from now. The PDF and the Word document are there along with the video so that you too can read and follow along. So... This is part two, uh, a look at evangelism, and we're going to look uh, from Ezekiel 33. So turn in your Bibles to Ezekiel 33, and we're going to look at the first nine verses. Uh, this was your reading for the week. Uh, every week you ought to come ready to open your Bibles to the passage of Scripture that I have given you that will be uh, for next week. So this week is Ezekiel 33, starting verse 1. Now, the word of the Lord came to me, that's, it came to Ezekiel. Son of man, speak to your people and say to them, If I bring the sword upon a land, and the people of the land take a man from among them and make him their watchman, and if he sees the sword coming upon the land and blows the trumpet and warns the people, then anyone who hears the sound of the trumpet, if they don't take warning, the sword comes and takes them away, that person's blood is upon their own head. Because he heard the warning, and he didn't take it seriously. His blood shall be upon himself. But if he had taken the warning, he would have saved his own life. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet so that the people are not warned, and the sword comes and takes any one of them, that that person is taken away in his own sin, he's taken away because of his own iniquity, but his blood I will require at the watchman's hand. So you, son of man, I have made a watchman over the house of Israel. I've made you a watchman, is what he's telling Ezekiel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them a warning for me. If I say to the wicked, O wicked one, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked to turn him from his way, that wicked person will die in their sin, their iniquity, but his blood I require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked to turn away from his way, and he does not listen to you, that person shall die in his own iniquity. But you will have delivered your soul. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the words that you gave the prophet so long ago. Father, uh, it's amazing to me that as we read this word that was given 2,500 years ago, that it's still so pertinent to our day. It still touches us because, Father, your word is truth. And your word is truth. And your word is a light. So, Father, we give you praise and we thank you. We thank you for your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the key here to remember is you're a watchman. You are a watchman. If you say that you are a Christian... And I'm looking around, and I know who in here has been baptized and who has not. So listen very carefully. If you have been baptized, that is a public profession of faith. You have said, I do to Jesus Christ. You have said, it is like a, it is like a marriage. He is the bridegroom, you are the bride. You have said, I do. You have pledged your allegiance to him. Last week I told you you are a missionary. This week I want you to understand you're a watchman. You are the watchman for souls. He has given you a warning through his word that those who do not know Jesus Christ, <clears throat> their soul is required of them. They're going to be eternally separated from God in a place known as hell. This job as a watchman is not just those of the pastor. It's not just the pastor's job to be a watchman. It is everyone who said, I do to Jesus Christ. It is your job to be a watchman for other people. Not just your kids, 
not just your family, your friends, your acquaintances, people you meet, whoever. You are in charge of telling them they're in grave danger without Jesus Christ. Notice what he said. It's on your head if you do not tell them. That is a big burden. You are a watchman over the souls of mankind. So as we look at this course, we're looking at chapter 1 and the, introdu the introduction in chapter 1 this week. So we'll do this every week. So if you want to know what I'm going to preach on, well, make sure you do your work. Chapter 1 is what we're talking about today. So we're going to talk about, first of all, sin and separation. This is one of the most popular Bible verses. You'll see it at football games. You'll see it everywhere you go. For God so loved the world, He gave His only Son. Whoever believes in Him would not perish but have eternal life. For God does not send His Son into the world, condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. Now listen very carefully. People like to stop right there. Listen to the rest of it. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned. But. But. Whoever does not believe is condemned already. They are already standing condemned. If they do not believe. It's not that they're going to be condemned later. They're already condemned if they do not believe. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you're a teenage girl and you're sitting in church. Or if you're a grown man sitting anywhere in this world. You're condemned if you have not believed. Plain and simple. Whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Notice that. It, it didn't say... One of the ways, as long as you've accepted one of the ways. No. The name. If you, if you denounce Jesus Christ, you're condemned. This is the message of the watchman. This is what our message must be. The biggest understanding that we have when it comes to evangelism is this. Somehow, some way, we deserve heaven. I hear it all the time. But a loving God would not send people to hell. A loving God, this. A loving... No. If you utter those words, if you find yourself uttering those words, here's the problem you have. You do not understand the nature of your soul. You do not understand that you deserve to be condemned. Very simply. You do not deserve heaven. God does not owe you heaven. A loving God has to send people to hell who reject Jesus Christ because He is love. It is not love to allow everyone to come in when, when some people live in a great way and some people live in a terrible way. That's not love. It's love that sends people to heaven as well through Jesus Christ. We talked about a, a word in, in, the, in the course called hormatology. This is simply the study of sin. We have these words called geology, the study of the earth. Well, this is the study of sin. And it's also the study of lawlessness. Remember, we as people, we're lawless. We are lawless. We we, by our nature, want to reject God and His Word. And I, in the Course, I told you there's three ways that we do this. One is called transgression. Another is called iniquity. And another is called sin. And I gave you some illustrations. Here's transgression. I saw the speed limit change from 70 to 55, but I'm in a hurry. So I'm going to go ahead and drive 70, and I hope I don't get caught. That's transgression. Transgression. Iniquity. Here's iniquity. I know the speed limit is 55. I saw it go to 55. I want to go 70 because. I want to do it because who are you to tell me how fast to drive? Who do you think you are to tell me how to live? See, that's iniquity. Iniquity is willful sin regardless of what God says. Transgression is willful sin, but you know you're doing wrong. And here is sin. This is what sin is. What do you mean the speed limit's 55? I could have sworn it was 70. That's the last speed limit sign I saw. And that's actually happened to me. 
My GPS thing said it was 70. The speed limit had changed. I didn't see the sign. I was talking to Shane Arno on the phone, and I was driving home from Fort Sam Houston one night at about 11.30 at night. I was talking to him to stay awake, and I got pulled over. The speed limit sign had changed. I did not know that, or I wouldn't have been speeding. I haven't had a speeding ticket since 1999. I didn't know. The guy gave me a warning, but I was still sinning because I was not following the perfect letter of the law. Whenever we do not follow God's exact will in every aspect of our life, we sin. Sometimes we can miss the mark. Because, see, that's what sin means. It means to miss the mark. Sometimes we can miss the mark by a little bit. Or we can miss it by a mile. But, see, it doesn't matter. God doesn't give credit for near misses. He gives credit for perfection. Because, see, holiness is perfection. And, and, and God said, be holy because I'm holy. God is holy. He is perfect in all his ways. And we are to be held to the same standard. That is why he had to send Jesus. Because, see, Jesus was the perfect standard. He lived. He, if the speed limit was 55, Jesus was going 55 before he got to the speed limit sign. He never willfully transgressed. He never unknowingly transgressed the law. He never unknowingly sinned. He walked in a perfect way. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They are abominable deeds. There is none who does good, no, not one. Where God is holy, we are totally unholy. We have all become like one who is unclean, is what the Bible says. All our righteous deeds are but polluted garments. And I have explained this before. In the King James Version, you will see it read, all of the good things that we do, all the righteous deeds are but filthy rags, dirty rags. And literally what this means is that the best thing that you think you do, when, when you help out in places, when you give out tracts, uh, when, when, when I preach the gospel, whenever, whatever you do, and you have, your, you have those thoughts, you know, I'm, that was a good thing I did. According to the standard of God, that is toilet paper. Because when we talk about filthy rags in the Old Testament, that's what it's talking about. <laughs> It's literally toilet paper. They used rags. They didn't have toilet paper. So the things, the good things that you say you do, when compared to how good God is, the very best you can offer is used toilet paper. Now that's very graphic. But we all, like a leaf, and our iniquities are like the wind. It takes us away. As good as we think we are, we are never good enough for God's standard. No matter who you are, you can be Mother Teresa and people think she's just the saint of a person who never did any wrong. No, even Mother Teresa's righteousness and goodness, when compared to the holiness of God, is toilet paper. It's something you would find in a porta john. That's how disgusting it is. When compared to the holiness of God, that is why we have to have Jesus Christ. Because, see, we are separated from God. Because of this pollution of our bodies, of our minds, of our hearts. We're wicked in our hearts. It's just like oil and water. If I, if I put oil and water in a mason jar, it doesn't matter how much I shake that up. They will never mix. Why? Because their natures are totally separate. God is totally separate. His nature is totally separate from our nature. We cannot mix the two. Because if you are able to mix the two, and there are some chemical agents that you can put in there to make them mix, but here's what happens. You change the nature. See, if we added ourselves to God in the current state that we are, we would change God's nature. He would no longer be holy and perfect. You can take a gallon of milk and add just a, a, an ounce of vinegar in it. And you will change that milk forever. You, you turn it into buttermilk. And no matter how hard you try, you would never, there is no process known to man at this time to be able to convert that buttermilk back to milk. You can't get the vinegar out. So if we do not have something that changes our nature, we then become something else. And that something else is abomination to God. 
Because he cannot accept us. Because in order to accept us, if we don't have a changing agent, something that covers us and turns us into something like him, then he becomes like us. Then he's no longer God. Then he's no longer holy. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. This is one of your memory verses, John 3.36. It doesn't say that the wrath of God gets on him when he dies. No, the wrath of God is already there. If you are outside of Jesus Christ, God's wrath already sits on you. It clings to you. It doesn't matter how good you think your life is. You could have it all according to the standards of man. You could be the most popular person in school. You could have the nicest car and the nicest house. But you are a dead man walking. You are a dead teenage girl walking. You are a dead young man walking if you do not have Jesus Christ. Because God's wrath is clinging to you and there is nothing you can do to shake it off. Because Romans 6.23 says this, the wages of sin are death. That is eternal separation. Forever. And you are eternally separated in a place known as hell. You saw this in your chapter this week, Luke 16, verses 19 through 31. I want you to notice something. It doesn't say hell is like. You don't see that this is something like Jesus has said where it's like a parable. Because Jesus simply says in verse 19, there was a rich man. He didn't say, look, all this is like, like let's say there was a rich man. No, he said there was. What Jesus is saying is this is a fact. This really happened. And we've talked about this in the past. When did it happen? We don't know. It could have happened the week before. It could have happened a thousand years before. We don't know when the rich man and Lazarus interacted. We had no clue. But what we do know is we are told by Jesus Christ that hell is a real place. It is a real place of separation. In this passage, this is what we learn about hell. We learn that the dead, those who die without Christ are aware of where they are. The rich man knew he was in hell. You can see it by his dialogue with Abraham. So there's life after death. There is a theory out there, and it's, really, it's a heresy, that teaches that those who live a life that are dedicated to Jesus and are Christians, they go to heaven. Those who deny Jesus, they are um, obliterated. Okay? There's that, that, that heresy out there that teaches that, well, that they're destroyed. In other words, there is no hell. They just, they are annihilated. It's called the theory of annihilation. That is false because otherwise, otherwise Jesus is telling us a lie here. Now, I don't know about you, but I choose to say that Jesus does not lie. Amen. Okay, are we going to talk about, I mean, let's be real. So, we see that there is a place for those who are apart from God. It is known as hell. There's torment there. We hear the rich man talk about it. There's separation there. The dead remember who they were. And guess what? The dead there remember the life that they had before. The rich man knew he was rich. He knew his privilege. He knew all the good things that he had. The dead are also, get this, this will shatter some of your mind, uh, shatter your mind and some of these images of hell you have. The dead are remorseful. They do not wish this fate on anyone. We have this concept in our Christianity that, oh, the dead, the evil go, and they're just like demons and all oh, wicked, wicked. No, 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 no. It doesn't say that. It says they don't want to be there. They realize they have messed up. And they hate it so much that they, are, they, they wish, oh, and they're probably praying, I, I, God, I, I don't, please, don't let my sister come here. Don't let my brother... See, that's what the rich man was saying. He didn't want his brothers to join him. So guess what? There's still love there. There's still a type of love. Because he loved his brothers so much, he cared for them so much, he didn't want them to be with him. They're conscious. There's no annihilation. And this is the place that is there, originally created for the devil and his angels, but it is there for those who reject Jesus Christ. But 
God never puts anything on us without giving us a solution. Here's the solution. Hebrews 9.22 Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Okay, so that means there is a way to forgive my sin. Because if you say without, you know, I can't do this without that. Well, that means if I get that, then I can do this. So there is a way to forgive sins. It is the shedding of blood. Why? What? That sounds just so terrible, shedding of blood. And you know there are denominations today that have taken out the mention of the blood. And we need to understand that it is the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from our sin. Why did God use the blood? Because He wants you to understand how deadly serious your sin is. Your sin is so serious that it costs life. It's that serious. Otherwise, God could just wipe it away. Okay, oh, you know what? I'm making a. I, I'm going to do like an executive order. We've heard about that a lot in the news, the last several years. I'm going to make an executive order. I don't need. I don't. I don't need uh, blood. No, he didn't do that. It's a serious thing. It's deadly serious. First John, two two says he is the propitiation for our sins, and not only for ours, but the sins of the whole world. That word propitiation is a legal term and it means an appeasement. And what it is is an act that is performed on the behalf of someone else. So what we see here is that Jesus shed his blood not for himself. He shed it for you. He is your appeasement. See, what that means is that God cannot be appeased by anything you do apart from the shed blood of Jesus Christ. No matter how good you think you can be, it does not satisfy God. Why? Because your goodness is filthy rags. But Jesus appeased the wrath of God. Jesus Christ, whom God put forward as a propitiation, that appeasement, by his blood, that's how he did it. The shed blood of Jesus was all the appeasement God needed. To be received by faith. See, he's done this for you. He's done it already. <coughs> but, if, if, I, if I have a gift for you, and you choose not to pick it up, it's still your gift, but if you don't pick it up, you don't have it. This appeasement has to be picked up by us as people, by us as men and women and boys and girls. It has to be picked up by us through faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. This is what Jesus did. It is a free gift to all who believe. And so that is the reason why we are talking about evangelism. What is evangelism? It is simply the sharing and the teaching of the good news about Jesus Christ. That by his sacrifice on the cross, our sins have been covered in his blood. And this pardon is available to everyone who had placed their faith and their trust in it. That's evangelism. And that is your job, it's my job. <clears throat> we go back to the very first book of the Bible. Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. It has been God's intention all along to send Jesus Christ. We read it. The Lord God said to the serpent, in verse 14 here, Because you have done this, you are cursed above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and the dust of the ground you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He will bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. This is what we know as the Proto-Evangelium. Okay? This is the first time we see the gospel message in the Bible. We see what God's intention is. How is he going to stop this thing called sin? How is he going to destroy it? Through the seed of a woman, through Jesus Christ. Why do you think why do you think Pharaoh wanted to kill all the little boys in Egypt? It, it wasn't just because he didn't like the Hebrews. It was because he was trying to stop. And Satan was using him to do to stop the birth of Jesus Christ down in the future. Why do you think Cain killed Abel? Because Satan knew that through Abel's line, the Messiah could come. It wasn't going to come through Cain's. So he killed him. 
why do you think all throughout history, why do you think that the, the Babylonians wanted to seize and kill all the Jews? You, you see it in the book of Esther. You see it all throughout the scripture. Why? It's Satan's attempt to stop the seed of the woman who he knew would be sent through the... See, Satan already knew who Jesus Christ was because Jesus Christ is co-eternal with the Father. Jesus Christ is the creator. Jesus Christ created the world. Jesus Christ in the form of God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Satan already knew Jesus. He knew that God the Father was going to send him God the Son. And he's like, okay, i got to do everything I can. Genesis 6, he tried to pollute the DNA. All throughout the Old Testament, you see time after time after time, Satan trying to kill off the seed of the woman. And now he does it today. We see it in the Spanish Inquisition. We see it through Adolf Hitler. We see it through all of these things. Today we see it in the United Nations, this very day, trying to destroy God's promise. Because see, let me tell you what Satan is doing. If he can destroy God's promise, then that means God's not God. He is trying to destroy the promises of God. Because if you can't get all the promises of God, you can only get most of them, then that means God can't be trusted to deliver. But he can. That is the reason why Israel is never going to get wiped off the map because the book of Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and numerous others, Zechariah, show the promises, the promises that God has given the Jews. But if Satan can destroy them, then he can prove all of that a lie. But this is the first time in the Bible where we see the gospel. So you say, what, what, what does that have to do with me? But see, this is where you come in. <clears throat> this is where you come in. How can the person call on them? See, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved, is what the previous verse says. But Paul says, how can they call on him if they have not believed? And how can they believe in him who they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching it? In other words, all these people out there, how can they believe if, you, if they never hear it? They can't. That's where you come in. And unfortunately, we have really mistranslated this verse. Really badly. Because what you just heard, a lot of you, wait, preaching, I'm not a preacher. I'm not a pastor of a church. I'm not a preacher. Therefore, it's not my job. That's what some of you heard. That's wrong. That is a wrong interpretation. This is the importance sometimes of getting down to the Greek. Because people say, well, I'm not a preacher. I don't preach, so this verse doesn't apply to me. That is absolutely wrong. And the King James Version even goes even further. How shall they hear unless there is a preacher? Not just unless somebody preaches to them. How are they here unless there's a preacher? Well, here's how you need to know sometimes the Greek. And we talked about this, you know, this using the sword. Uh, the Greek word there is caruso, and it means to proclaim in the manner of a herald, to publish, to openly proclaim something that has been done. I said earlier you are a watchman, but another way of saying this is you are a herald. And some of you know my other email, not Nelson at agapehomefellowship.org. My other email is krux123 at yahoo.com. K-E-R-U-X-123. See, that is the other Greek word. It's real similar to Caruso. Kerux is a herald or messenger that is vested with some public authority. We see this in 1 Timothy 2, verse 7. Listen very carefully. Paul says, For this I was appointed a preacher. Here we have the office of preacher. Anytime we're talking about the office of preacher, we see the Greek word kerux. But, the duties of Romans 10, 14, we do not see the Greek word kerux. We see the Greek word caruso. That means it's everybody's job. That means it is your job to be a herald. Your job to be an evangelist. Remember what we talked about last week in Matthew 28. Jesus said, all of you. He didn't just point to a few of the apostles and say, okay, I'm going to talk to these guys. Everybody else just, you know, just... Hold what you got. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to Peter, James, and John. He didn't do that. He was talking to hundreds of people before he left. He was talking to women. He was talking to children. He was talking to the apostles. He was just talking to some, some regular guys who were still fishermen. 
He said, you, while you're going, make disciples. In other words, this is exactly what Paul is saying. You are to be a herald. You are to be a Caruso. Now, some of you are going to be a Carux. Some of you are going to be appointed and called out and, 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 and ordained to be a pastor, a preacher. That's your calling. But everyone is a herald. Everyone. And what are we a herald of? Well, we're a herald of this thing known as Christianity. And what this thing is known as Christianity depends on is belief. You hear people all the time saying, well, I believe. I'm a, I'm a believer. Well, what does it mean? Charles Finney said this, and I love this passage uh, in his Systematic Theology, uh, lecture number 55 on faith and unbelief. He says this, Belief is an efficient state of mind, and therefore <laughs> it must consist in the embracing of the truth by the heart or the will. In other words, there's truth out there. I've got to embrace it. It is the will's closing in on the truths of the gospel. It is the soul's act of yielding itself up. In other words, I give myself to these truths. Committing itself to the truths of the evangelical system, of everything the Bible says about Jesus. It is trusting in Christ and committing the soul and the whole being to him in his various offices and relations to men. It is confiding in him, and in it is being what is revealed in him, in his word, his providence, and by his Holy Spirit. Charles Finney also said this, what can you believe if you don't know it? How can you believe anything you don't if you don't know it? I, I can tell you some things, and, and if you do not know them, you don't know to believe them or not. So what is belief, and what is faith? Now, if you did your coursework, if you did your coursework, you came ac across three Latin words. Three Latin words. Notidia, ascensus, and fiducia. Okay? Real fancy. But, what is true faith? What is saving faith? Saving faith is one, notidia. Notidia is, I have knowledge of the content of the gospel. In other words, I know everything that's in there. A census is, I am convicted that those things are truth. You can't tell me otherwise that they are truth. They are truth. You can't convince me that they're false, or only part of them is true and part of them is false. I am totally convinced. But see, that does not save me. Having head knowledge does not save me. What fiducia is, it's Latin, it means trust. Trust is, I have an assured reliance on the character, the ability, the strength, or the truth of someone or something. So, let me just sum it up like this. What is true saving faith? We talked about this in the, in the, in the chapter. What is true saving faith? It is, I know the knowledge about the gospel. I understand the basic facts. It is I am convinced, convicted and convinced that they are truth, and it is that I have placed my trust in that. And I know. Paul said it this way to Timothy. He goes, I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced he is able to keep that which I have committed to him against that day. That is true saving faith. That is true belief. And, and we see that. In Acts chapter 18, these aren't in your book, but they're going to be in the next edition. Acts chapter 18, verse 24 through 26. Now a Jew named Apollos, that, that should sound familiar to you for those of you who, who have read 1 Corinthians. A Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he only knew the baptism of John. And when he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. So this is very important. Apollos had a good set of knowledge, but he didn't have all the facts. Okay? He, he knew what John had been doing, and that John said somebody was coming. But he didn't know the rest of the story. We also see this in Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 5. And it happened that while Apollos, here he is again, was at Corinth. Remember, Paul set up the Corinthian church. Apollos came and he, and he watered it. 
Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. He found some disciples. He said, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, oh, what are you talking about? What, what's the Holy Spirit? He said, okay, you're a believer. Who, who, who were you baptized under? He said, we were baptized into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling people to believe in the one who was to come after. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. See, what Paul did was he expounded upon their partial knowledge. Here's the problem. The Ephesians here, disciples, they had just enough knowledge to make them dangerous. They had been given just enough to make them think they knew something and they were on to something. Paul and Priscilla and Aquila take the time to expound the gospel because we have to believe all the facts, not just a little, oh, I love Jesus. You'll hear that a lot. I love Jesus. Well, what do you know about Jesus? Well, I don't even know there's a such thing called the Holy Spirit. You've got to know a certain list of facts, and we, we'll study that in a couple of weeks. Um, here's what you need to remember. It doesn't make sense. You're going to take this evangelistic message and you're going to tell it to people and they are going to look at you like you're crazy. The word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. It, it doesn't make sense. And, and the word folly there is from the Greek word moriah and it means moron. In other words, these people are going to think you are a moron <clears throat> because what you're telling them does not make sense. What we need to remember that evangelism is a work of the Holy Spirit. It's not a work of our intellect. It's not a work of how well we can craft a message. Evangelism is the work of the Holy Spirit. Now we receive not the spirit of the world, but the spirit of who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given to us by God, and we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for it is folly to them. He does not understand. He is not capable of understanding because they have to be spiritually discerned. People who are lost, when you share the gospel and you tell them, unless the Holy Spirit is working, they're going to look at you like you have lost your ever-loving mind because it doesn't make sense. And you need to remember that these spiritual truths are not something that the natural man can understand. You cannot tell the natural man about spiritual things. He doesn't understand it. And unless the Holy Spirit's there to enlighten him, he won't understand it. He won't understand it. So when we do this, when we share our message, we need to understand that it will cost us. 2 Timothy 3.12 All who desire to live godly in Jesus Christ will be persecuted. The real question is, is what kind of life are you desiring to live? Um... You're going to be persecuted for your beliefs. People within the sound of my voice in our house churches in India know this persecution on a different level. But why do we do this? Because the love of Christ controls us. 2 Corinthians 5.14 says, The love of Christ controls us. It is the love of Jesus Christ that will put our, that will cause us to put ourselves in harm's way. And so how much will it cost you? Linda, we were just talking about this. It will cost you relationships. Okay? Kids at school, Giselle, it's going to cost you relationships to live like Jesus. So, do not think that I have come to bring peace to this earth. See, oh, Jesus is love. Jesus is peace. Do not think I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A person's enemies will be those of his own house. Whoever loves his father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Matthew 10, 34 through 37. If anyone comes to me, and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Luke 14, 26. Hate is a very strong word. What it means is, where's your allegiance? Who are you going to be allied to? 
Who, who is going to be in your alliance? Who are you going to give your primary allegiance to in your life? Is it going to be your kids? Is it going to be your mom and dad? Is it going to be your wife? or your? Or, what about yourself? I, I want to ask a serious question. I want everybody listening. Listen. Just what did you think you were doing when you said, I do? What did you think you were getting into? When you walked that aisle, or however you did it, and you were baptized, what did you think you were doing? You're getting fire insurance? Is that all you got? Is that all you want? Is fire insurance? I don't want to go to hell. Is that what you thought the extent of this life is? This? That's not it. He says here, this is Jesus. He, he says, did you think that God is calling you to something that doesn't have a price? There's a cost. It's going to cost you relationships. It's going to cost you sleep. It's going to cost you fun time. It's going to cost you things that, wow, the world really likes to do this, and I can't do this anymore. You're going to be forced to take a stand for God at some point in your life. Somebody is going to go directly and contrary to the word of God, and you're either going to have to say, I stand with God or I stand with you. You're either going to have to side with God or you're going to have to side with your father, your mother, your son, your daughter. It's a choice that you've got to make. I want you to make sure that you get this. Everybody listen. Please understand, you do not get to have it both ways. You don't get to have it both ways. You don't get to say, I love Jesus, but yet I'm going to stand with my, my, my kid's decision to live a lifestyle that is outside the, the bounds of God. You don't say, I'm going to, I'm going to stay. I love Jesus. No, no, no. Jesus himself said, when you do this, you are not, get this, please listen. When you choose someone in your family and their sin over the word of God, Jesus says, you are not worthy of me. You're not worthy of me. You are not worthy to be called my disciple. That is harsh. We have this image of Jesus as being this loving God, and he's so loving. That is harsh. You're not worthy of me. If you're going to choose everything else over me, you're not my disciple. You have to choose who your primary allegiance is is going to be given to. And sadly, there are Christians all over this country and all over this world who have made their allegiances very clear. Their allegiance is to someone else besides Jesus Christ. Period. End of story. Their allegiance is to their husband. Their allegiance is to their wife. Their allegiance is to their kids. Their allegiance is to their friends. But it ain't to Jesus. Their allegiance is to the things that they want to do. But it's not to Jesus. They say they love Jesus. But when the rubber meets the road, and I remember my pastor in First Baptist Church Old Ocean, Bobby Good, used to say this all the time. That's where the rubber meets the road, big boy. Where the rubber meets the road is they are forced to look at their loved ones in the eye and they say, I love you so much, but I must stand true to what God has said. I have no choice. I have said that to a loved one, to a family member. I've looked them in the eye. I have said, I have no choice. I will stand on God's word. You need to know that this is going to cost you. You need to be prepared for it. It's going to create conflict. And in this course, I want you to know that this series is to help you evangelize. I'll make you stand up. You need to get this. It's to help you evangelize. I want you to look again at these passages in your, in, when you get home. I want you to ask yourself one question. Could I step in right now and correct somebody's false doctrine? Like Apollos, was, was, he didn't have it all. Could I be Priscilla and Aquila or, the, or Paul and go in and correct somebody's false ideas? Can you do that? Could you go, wait, you know what, that doesn't sound right, but I'll get you in touch with somebody. That's not what the Bible teaches us to do. The Bible teaches us to learn it, to know it, and go tell them that ourselves. 
You need to know that your field, your harvest field, is, is all America, and it's going to be filled with the Apollos types who are going to know just enough to make them dangerous. You, as I have given you these, these uh, uh, surveys and studies over and over and over again, we see that a whole bunch of people say they belong to Jesus. But yet, over and over and over again, they're like Apollos. They're like the disciples in Ephesus. They don't know. And how can they know unless somebody teaches them? That's where you come in. One reason that this course is designed the way it is designed is so that you can pull Apollos aside. You can pull that friend of yours aside when you hear them say something that doesn't match up with God's Word. And you can show them. Because there are a lot of people out there, if you just show them in the Bible, they'll believe it. They say they love Jesus, and a lot of them do, but they don't know the full Jesus. You've got to show them. You've got to show them. And, and your field is going to be full of these people. You're going to meet them every day. They could be in your family. And as I said last week, you're going to get out of this course what you're going to put into it. Period. End of story. If you put 5% into this course, you're going to get 5% out of it. Period. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want that. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he receives an award. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved. But as only one coming through the fire, that is 1 Corinthians 3, 14 and 15. Each of one of us has to make up our minds. You as an adult, you as a teenager, has to make up our minds. Are we going to be the one standing in a re with a reward? Kids, it is not too early for you to start thinking about this. So is it good enough that you go and stand before Jesus and get into heaven? And then when it comes time to give Jesus his reward, to cast our rewards at his feet, all you've got is a bunch of ashes. You realize how embarrassing that's going to be? But there are Christians out there that Paul says, you're going to be saved, you're Christians. But it's like you're saved by the skin of your teeth. I don't want that for you. I don't want that for myself. I want... As, as our life goes through that refining fire of the Bema Seat, I want you to have so much reward to offer Jesus. Because that's where it's going. I don't want you to be standing there with a bucket full of ash. This is the in some extent of my 70 years as a Christian. How embarrassing when Paul and all these people are throwing their crowns and their rewards at Jesus' feet. You're going... There's a reason why God says he's got to wipe away every tear. The tears are going to come from that. If you want to live a life that gets you into heaven by the skin of your teeth, then be prepared to reap the consequences of it. That is what this course is about. Next week we're going to talk about there's a process. And we're going to look at Romans 10, verses 9 through 15. Romans 10, 9 through 15. So as we enter in our time of discussion, here's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about only things that are in the course. Normally we have discussion times and we can go all over the place. If you had questions this week, if you underlined something, if you wanted something further clarified, this is the time to do that. Because when we're done here, we're going into worship time. As soon as I turn that off, we go into worship time. So if you had a question, Something didn't make sense. You want something expanded, expounded upon. You need something clarified. Now is the time. And next week, know that the discussion time is the time to ask those questions. You, By all means, please ask me during the week if you want to. That's okay. I don't mind that at all. But I'm saying that this is what discussion time is for. So if you come across something and you have a question, you say, hmm, if I don't get this, maybe somebody else doesn't. This would probably be a good question for me to ask. Then ask it during the discussion time. So, I'll start by talking about memory verses. Remember, I said what you put into this is what you're going to get out of it. And what I have found every time I've taught this course, and this course has been through like four or five different rewrites, and I've taught it three or four times. And every time, the problem that people get hung up on is they don't do their memory verses. They don't do them. I have yet to meet one person who actually memorized all their memory verses for the week. And 
I know there's a lot in week one. It gets significantly less as we move on. And you don't have to know them by this week, but I want you to know them, some of them. Okay? So, in John 4, Jesus is dealing with the Samaritan woman. What does he tell her? What does he tell his disciples as she's approaching? Anybody? Say this. Do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Mm -hmm. Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. That's right. That's the memory verse. Now have that memorized. Because here's what you have if you understand that. You understand, if you get this verse, if you internalize this verse, you will realize that when you're at your job, when you're at the grocery store, when you're at school, there are literally, do you understand? The, the, do you understand that there are people all around you going to hell? All around you. You sit with them in class. You beat them at the grocery store. You have to be looking and understand that all around, everywhere on this street, the field is it's ready to go. You had something? How do I use this memory verse to to tell somebody? I mean, do, I mean, there has that, to be a way. Not every memory verse is so that you can tell them. Some memory verses are to get you to understand that, wow, just like in Jesus' day when he saw the crowd, because see, what happened? The Samaritan woman went and told people about Jesus. Mm -hmm. Hey, this guy just went and he, he, he told me everything I ever done. Mm -hmm. And so people came. She was an evangelist. She had done more for the furtherance of the gospel than any of those dudes walking with him at the time. They hadn't done anything. They hadn't been sent out. They hadn't been sent out on their missionary journeys yet. They'd just been listening to the master. In a course of an afternoon, she had gone and got everybody in her town. That's the attitude we have to have. Okay? All right. So, uh, where'd Javier go? Work. Huh? Work. Work? Okay. Uh, who else knew uh, John 3.36? John 3.36. Very important verse. We about yep. We were talking about that. And how did he did have it memorized. Because I asked him. He told me. Mm -hmm. So here was his time, and he had to work. Whoever believes in the Son, does that sound familiar now? Has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but finish it. That's right. Guys, you should don't, don't hold back. If you know it, tell me. If you don't, memorize your verses. Very simple, right? Remember what I said. Being a true disciple costs you things. It's going to cost you time in front of the television because you're trying to memorize the Word of God. What does Hebrews 11 tell us about faith? Hebrews 11, verse 1. Now faith is assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Okay, so... Next week when I ask you what does such and such say, you're going to be able to tell me, oh, I know what it says without having to look in your book, right? You're going to say, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. In other words, faith is that thing that I hope for, but I ain't got no evidence to support it, but I don't care. That's faith. Okay? All right. Um, 2 Timothy 3, verse 12, promises you something if you desire to live a godly life in Jesus. What does it promise you? Persecution. Persecution. That's a great promise, ain't it? Yes. It is. You know why? Remember what happened, bless you. Remember what happened in, in, in Acts chapter 4? When, when they were beaten because they had gone and, and were sharing the gospel? Peter and John? What was their reaction when they were beat? Did they did they call their lawyer? No. Okay, they didn't call their lawyer. Did they complain about it? No. No. What did they do? Praise God. They praised God. Because why? Why did they praise God? Okay, that was a reward from God. 
They could not believe that they had been found worthy to be persecuted for the name of Jesus. Wow. Does that not change your thinking a little bit about your, this thing you call Christian life? We've all got a choice to make. And, and so I go back to the same question before we close. What did you think you were getting into when you said, I'm a Christian? I'm going to be a Christian. Somebody passes you on the street. Somebody calls you in school. I'm a Christian. What did you think that means? Oh, that means I'm going to heaven. Do you think that's all it is? you think that's all God wants for you? you think that's all that God demands of you? If that was true, you'd be gone. He, if that was true, he could have summed up that in, in about a half a page. But I see a whole lot of stuff in here. I honestly did believe it was going to be easier. Honestly. It ain't. It's not. Anything that's worth doing, it ain't easy. Huh? It isn't our home. Yeah, that's right. This is not our home. You are a pilgrim. You are a stranger passing through a strange land. So were there any questions that you saw this week? Anything you came across that you didn't understand? You will have next week, I promise you. <laughs> I promise you in chapter 2 you're going to have questions. So write them down. Put big question mark, circle it. We're going to have to talk later because I've got a lot. Okay. <laughs> She's a special project. Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay. Remember, you said you were going to sleep. I am. Okay, so we are going to do a prayer call tomorrow night if I can get in. If not, whoever can get in. I, I tried last week, and I got the exact same thing that's been happening in Brenda where it went. We're sorry, the number you were dialing is busy at this time or something like that. It was a busy signal. I tried three times. No go. So I don't know why, but that's just the way it is. So... Um, so next week, um, let's see here. Um, oh, thanks to Liz. I want you guys to know that I have two different things now. Under the Learn tab, Reading God's Word and Methods of Bible Study. Okay, Liz sent me a text early in the week, I think it was Wednesday, and said, hey, did you ever put that stuff on there? I said, no, I did not. I forgot all about it. I'm thanking you for reminding me. So I went ahead and stuck some stuff on here about how to read God's Word. How do I study God's Word? So these are the methods of Bible study. There's several different methods. And this is some reading God's Word. There's some reading plans in there. If you want to read the Bible through in a year, two years, nine, 90 days even, there's a plan. There's all sorts of different plans in there. I think I've got like 10 different Bible reading plans. So you have no excuse. If you're not reading God's Word, you have no excuse. Okay. So uh, let's close in prayer, and then we're going to go into our private worship time. Father, I do thank you. I give you praise. Lord, help us to remember. Lord, I, I'm guilty of it. I'm guilty of it, Lord. That I do not look and understand that the person who cuts me off while I'm driving, uh, the person who, who does evil against me or, or, or says terrible things. Father, I don't look at them as if they're a person condemned already. I look at them as, a, as an adversary, but they're not my adversary. Father, help me to look at them as a harvest field. They're a crop to be harvested by you. And it's my job to do whatever I can to see that one day they're in heaven with me, by, the, by my side. Help us to have eternal perspective. Please, Lord, give us your wisdom. Open up our eyes. That's what Jesus was telling his disciples. Look, he said. In other words, look. Open your eyes, guys. Look at what's going on around you. Help us to do that, Lord. Father, I have been guilty of going through my life so many times just rejoicing in the fact that I have fire insurance and, and not really caring about anything else. Forgive me. Help us to look through the eyes of Jesus. To love through the eyes of Jesus. Help us to remember that we're to be Jesus with flesh on, as my brother Brad Duboso said. We're to be Jesus with flesh on. 
Help us to have the hands of Christ to love our world. We thank you, Father. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a good night.